Yes. Well, if you're a guest today, uh, that was some footage of something we did last weekend that we call Love Weekend. Uh, we do those a couple times a year here at Wellspring Church because it's really important to us. Maybe you've seen the hashtag that we hashtag Love MB. Uh, it, it means a great deal to talk about it a, a lot. Um, we put a lot of effort and energy into making sure that Myrtle Beach is a better place because our church is here. And uh, it's very important to us. And today's kind of a big day because what we do is we celebrate what we've done in 18. Uh, we're taking an offering a little later to help fund what we're going to do uh, in 2019. And what I kind of thought would be, would be appropriate today, especially if you're a guest, maybe you're new, maybe you're new to our church, or, or maybe so I think it's always good for all of us to be refreshed from time to time. Why do we do this? Why do we, do we give? Why do we love? Why is it such a big deal for us to be a part of the community? We're in a series right now called Tis the Season. Uh, last week we talked about it was Tis the Season to give. This week, Tis the Season to love. There's no better time than right now to, to love. We're thinking about uh, other people. It's a natural thing that happens at Christmas. Uh, we begin thinking about ways to serve other people. And so I just wanted to, to very quickly just, just sort of answer that question and, and may, maybe answer it for the first time or, or, or reestablish the why behind we as a church talk so much about loving our community and serving our community while we're taking an entire Sunday to take up an offering uh, that we're going to basically use to help love Myrtle Beach in 2019. You know, why do we do that? And the answer is actually pretty simple. Uh, the reason we do that is because Jesus told us to. And we sort of think that he's kind of the man, that he's kind of in charge. And we think as Christians that whatever he says to do, we should do. And if we do it, our lives are going to be better. Um, and, if, if, and if you've been around Wellspring now for, for a while, uh, maybe you've been here all, all, this, all this semester since about Labor Day, we've pretty much been talking about the same thing. Uh, we've been talking about this idea that Jesus is right and that our lives will be better if we follow him. And not only our lives, but that the community will be better if we follow him and if we show his love and if we live like he wanted us to live. And so, so today's really a culmination of what we've been talking about for, for about two or three months. And uh, it's been really fun and really exciting. But, but today, I just want to super, super as clearly as possible, help us just to all know, as we're continuing to walk into this Christmas season, as maybe you're going to give today, as maybe you're thinking about how you're going to serve next year, as you're thinking about the way you can impact uh, your friends and your family, your neighbors and your, and your coworkers and your community, you know, why do we do this? Why do we want to love Myrtle Beach? And like I said, Jesus answers this question for us, and he answers it basically throughout his ministry. His entire ministry revolves around loving other people, serving other people, helping other people. But on the last night he spent with all his disciples, all his, his, his innermost circle, his closest followers, the guys that he was going to use to kind of launch his mission into the world, uh, the last night he spent with them, uh, before he was arrested and before he went to trial and before he was eventually you know, nailed to a cross and he died on that Friday afternoon, he's buried, and then Sunday morning he, he comes back to life and he launches this movement that, that changes the world. On that Thursday night, he hangs out with his friends and, and he has something that uh, you've probably seen it. Uh, uh, we, this is, there's, there's famous art about this. It's been, it's been portrayed in movies. You maybe heard it talked about. It's called The Last Supper. Um, it's where Jesus hangs out with his disciples. Um, if you've ever heard the story about Jesus washing his disciples' feet, uh, this is where he did that. This is also where he instituted something that we call communion. Um, if you've been around church at all, communion is where, you know, you take your little, your little bread and your little juice and you eat it, you drink it, and you say, do this in remembrance of me. We do that because on this night I'm talking about, Jesus instituted that. He said, hey guys, I'm going to be gone soon, and I want you to do this so you can remember me, and I need you to pass this on. And that same night, Jesus explained why it is so crucial, why it is so important for his followers, for his representatives, to make sure they love their communities, to make sure they love other people. It's as if he knew, hey, this night is going to become famous. And he looks at this guy named John, and John's actually the guy who records this story. And it's as if he looked at John, he was like, hey, John, I'm about to say something, and I really need to make sure you get this right. Because when you guys are looking back, when you're trying to figure out what to do, how to follow me, I want you to remember this 
moment above all. And the reason he wanted them to remember it above all is because he was going to say something that was going to clarify everything else they did. He even phrased it that way. So, so just imagine yourself. You're in this room. They're having dinner. They have no idea what's about to happen. But Jesus knows this is the last meal he's going to spend with them. He knows he's what it's about to happen. He's about to get arrested. So he's got to, got to set the stage for them. Hey, guys, when you think back on this moment, I need you to remember what to do. Because you have a job to do. I want you to go launch this movement that's going to change the world. So after dinner, Jesus, they're talking. And then Jesus says something amazing. Again, this is recorded by, uh, for us in the book of John. John was an eyewitness. He was one of Jesus' uh, best friends and closest followers. And he records for us what Jesus says. And this is why we should love Myrtle Beach and why you should love your neighbors and why love is such a big deal to us. Because this is what Jesus said right after dinner. He said, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Now, this should have been a big deal. He'd been with them for three years, and he's saying, hey, guys, this is something new. So they're all their ears perk up. And then he says, love each other. And they're like, dude, you say love each other all the time. What do you mean? How is this new? And he says, well, listen to me. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. He's like, hey, guys, hey, guys, if, if later you're looking back and you're wondering how, what to wrap this thing around, what, what the most important thing is, what should be your driving force, make it this, make it love. Love each other. Love other people. How? The same way I've loved you. The same way I've cared for you. The same way I've served you. The same way I've put your needs first. The same way I've done everything for the last three years to make sure your life is better. That's what I'm now charging you with. I want you to love each other. I want you to love other people. I want you to love the world. In the same way your life has been better for the last three years because I've been in it. Everything you do, everywhere you go, I want people to say my life is better because they're in it. I want you to love each other. Why, Jesus? Here's the answer. Because your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. He says, hey guys, you're going to wonder in the future, how do you prove I'm real? You're going to wonder in the future, how do you prove that I died and came back to life? How do, how do you prove I did miracles? And I need you to remember what I just told you. I'm giving you a new command. Love each other like I've loved you because that is how you will prove to the world that I'm real. And that is how you will prove to the world that you are my followers. And that is how you will prove to the world that following me is better. Now, Jesus could have said anything in that moment. He could have said, I'm going to give you the power to perform miracles, and I want your miracles, and they will prove that you are my disciples. He didn't say that. He didn't say, your ability to argue someone into submission is going to prove to the world you're my disciples. Your ability to build a logical argument is going to prove to the world you're my disciples. That's not what he said. He says love. He says, your love for other people, that's what's going to prove that I'm Real, which makes perfect sense if you are a Christian. If you're a Christian in the room today, the reason you became a Christian, the reason you decided to follow him is because you eventually began to understand and you got a sense of the overwhelming love God had for you. The love that he showed through Jesus and that compelled you to want to follow him. You were not moved by Jesus' teachings. As I've said before, most of us don't actually like most of Jesus' teachings when we apply them to ourselves. We love to apply them to other people. They're fantastic for other people. But nobody become a, becomes a Christian because they're like, man, Jesus told me all the stuff I did wrong. And I was like, yeah, dog, let's go. Like, no one does that. You were moved to follow, to follow Jesus. You were moved to be a Christian because at some point you were convinced that he loved you. And that he loved you so much that he gave his life for you. And that he loved you so much that he wanted to give you better than you deserved. That's why you became a Christian. So doesn't it make sense that Jesus would put the entire movement on our shoulders and say, Hey, the very same thing that moved your heart, the very same thing that convinced you, is what's going to convince the world. So make sure whatever you do make sure that you love other people. Make sure that the world is a better place because you're in it. Because as you help people, as you make things better, you will earn the right to talk about me. Jesus knew what he was doing. So we love Myrtle Beach. Because Jesus says that is our response to what he did for us. 
And we love Myrtle Beach because when you follow the history of the early church, you know it worked. Love works. We just finished a series of six weeks of, that we called Citizen X, and we kept talking about uh, the early church and how they had this massive success where they grew from basically this small group of, of, of 11 guys into uh, so large that basically the entire Roman Empire became Christian within 300 years. And we talked about all the reasons why that was, and we looked at some of Jesus' teachings, and we talked about it. But, but one of the things I didn't tell you is this has actually been studied from a non-spiritual point of view. There have been sociologists that have studied the movement of Christianity because, it, because it's pretty unexplainable how this, how this movement, how this religion just sort of took off out of nowhere. And, and one of the things they've established, that there's really two or three different criteria. I'm, I'm going to talk about two of them today. One of them is it came about during the Roman Empire, during the height of the Roman Empire, which was really great because it was the first time in the known world there had been roads to most places. You could travel there safely, and most people spoke remotely close to the same language. Like, never in human history could you travel as far and speak to as many people as you could when Christianity launched. Wow, talk about timing. It's almost like God's real. And uh, number two, um, during that 300-year period, um, there were two and maybe three plagues that occurred in the Roman Empire. And these plagues were horrifying to, to the Roman people, to, to pagan people, to, to atheist people, to people who didn't have a God at all because they feared death, because they had no idea what was coming. If you don't believe in a God, back then they, they, they either they didn't believe in a God or they believed in the Roman gods. And if you ever studied the Roman gods in school, they were scary and they weren't nice and they had nothing good waiting for people. And so, so death was this really scary thing. Combined with, there was no ethic, there was no idea of love your neighbor. Jesus launched that. There was no idea of the greater good. It was all every man for himself. So in most of these areas, when the plagues would come, everyone who wasn't a Christian fled because they were, they were horrified of death and they were horrified of disease. And if anything, if they believed in a God, they thought, well, the God's punishing you with this disease, so you must have done something wrong. And I don't know what you did, but I don't want you to get me sick. And so people abandoned the cities. They abandoned friends. They abandoned family members. They left them there to die. One group stayed. And that was Christians, because the Christians were not afraid of death. They knew what was coming next. And not only were they not afraid of death, they had been taught from the beginning that your job is to help people. So the Christians stayed, and they helped. And it turns out that the plagues weren't as dangerous as they thought. And with just a little bit of care and a little bit of, of maintenance and a little bit of whatever primitive medicine they had at the time, you could nurse people back to help. So these people who had been abandoned by their friends and by their family start getting cared for by all these Christians. And they start looking at them. And they're like, why are you doing this? No one does this. Why are you helping me? Why are you taking care of me? And then the Christians begin to explain, well, it's, it's because we're Christians. And they're like, well, what does that mean? And they begin to tell them about Jesus. And they begin to tell them what's happened. And these people, they begin to convert to Christianity in droves. I mean, what would you do? What would you do if everybody you knew in your life, everybody you loved in your life abandoned you and a random group of people came up and said, hey, we're going to help you. And when they said, why? If, and, and, you know, they said, well, there's an asteroid coming. You'd believe there's an asteroid coming, right? You'd be like, okay, well, you help. So this, this make, I'm in, makes sense to me. And so that's what began to happen. It, these people were just overwhelmed with the care and the love of, of the Christians. And, and it just began to spread and began to spread and began to spread. And if you've been here for the last month or so, you know that, that uh, within 300 years of Jesus's resurrection, the, the, the Roman emperor, a man named Constantine, converts to Christianity because, because Christianity is so prevalent in the Roman Empire, it's taken over so much, it's so popular, that he converts. And the reason it became so popular, according to sociologists, one of the driving factors was simply because of the love and care that Christians had for other people. Now, we actually have documentation about this because, because Constantine, he, he, he dies, he's gone. A couple of emperors later, this guy named Julian, he becomes the emperor of the Roman Empire, and he decides Christianity is not for him. He decides he wants to take it back. He wants to take Rome back to the founding fathers. And so he wants to go back to paganism. So, so he rebuilds a bunch of temples. He hires a bunch of pagan priests, and he tries to get everybody to convert back to paganism and to, be, to begin worshiping the Roman gods again. Only something happens. None of them want to go back. He can't get people to come back to the temple. He can't get people to leave Christianity. And he gets so frustrated by this that he has a conversation with one of his priests. 
and we actually have a fragment of the letter, and we can see what an outsider's perspective is of Christians, because even he can understand that something's different, and that he can't get anyone to leave Christianity to come back to his pagan religion. And here's what he says, and, and he wrote a letter to, um, to a man named, um, what is it, yeah, uh, Arsacius. He uh, wrote a letter to Arsacius, who was one of his priests, and here's what he says. He says, hey, recent Christian growth is caused by their moral character, even if pretended, and by their benevolence towards strangers. I love that. You know what he's saying? He's saying these Christians are too good. Nobody is actually this good. Nobody loves their wife this much. Nobody loves their kids this much. Nobody loves other people this much. Nobody's really this good, but they're selling it well. And what's happening is their benevolence towards strangers is drawing people to their organization, drawing people to their group. And he keeps going. He says this. He says, I think that when the poor happen to be neglected and overlooked by our priests, by us, the impious Galileans observed this and devoted themselves to benevolence. You know what he's saying? He said, we weren't taking care of our own people. There was a gap. There was a need. And the Christians saw it. And they devoted themselves to helping. And when they devoted themselves to helping, people noticed, and no one wants to leave their group. No one wants to come back to us. You know what he's saying? He's saying when Christians act like Christians, nothing can stop them. Because who could compete with that? Who could compete with a group of people who knew that their home was secured in heaven and that their job on earth was to be God's representatives to a people who need them, to see the gaps in society, to see the gaps in culture, to see the gaps where people aren't helping, and to step in and to say, we'll help. Well, how long are you going to help? As long as it takes. Well, who are you going to help? Whoever needs it. Why? Because we serve a God that can raise the dead. And we want to introduce you to him. I mean, think about that. <laughs> Why do we love Myrtle Beach? Because we want to rescue Myrtle Beach. Because my wife and I didn't move here to start this church almost 10 years ago just to gather a bunch of people. We moved here because we believe God called us here to partner with him to save this region. And we cannot save this region until we're willing to get our hands dirty. Until we're willing to get in there and help this region. We want to love Myrtle Beach. We want people to not just hear about the love of Jesus. We want people to feel the love of Jesus. In fact, we want that to be the thing our church is known for. One of our church's core values from the very beginning has been that we will be known for what we are for. And you know what we're for? We're for Myrtle Beach. We're for the Grand Strand. We love Myrtle Beach. We want to see it succeed. We know great days are ahead. I can't believe I haven't said it yet. Go Seahawks. State champs, come on. We celebrate our community. We celebrate the wins and where there are struggles, where there is a need, where we can help, we step in. Because that's what Jesus asked us to do. And because history shows us that it works. And so today, in just a moment, we're taking up a one-time special offering to help fund what we believe God wants us to do in our community next year to love Myrtle Beach, to make it a better place. But before we do that, we wanted to share a few stories with you. One of these, the first story is a story from an organization called New Directions. We've been working with them for about five years, and they're going to tell you a little bit about what we've done and tell you also about what they want us to help them do in 2019. And then the next video is a story of a new partner coming on called the Family Justice Center. And uh, I'll, let, I'll let them explain, but this organization and what I believe God wants us to do with them next year is one of the most important things we've ever done. So um, as you continue to think and pray about why we do this, uh, let these videos remind you where the gaps are and how we can help. Check them out.
New Directions provides food, shelter, safety, and hope to homeless men, women, families with children and veterans in four shelters right here in Myrtle Beach. You all put in two wonderful raised above ground garden beds. We have used all of that produce in the kitchen to feed the clients. And actually we had a client that, that helped and I got to watch him blossom. And it was an amazing, amazing season. It was, it was very special to me, not only to have the food to feed our clients, but to see that, that transformation for him and to see him put his heart into the land and then to, to feed our, our clients. But that really was the catalyst of what brought life to him. And they work really hard with each individual to try to find what is important to that person and how to help them heal and take that next step. Can you talk a little bit about the courtyard that they put in for us? Yes, that started as basically a grassy mud pit out back. <laughs> um, there was nothing there and Wellspring turned it into a beautiful gravel area with a wonderful fence that was put around it and the guys do love to go out there and especially when the weather's nice they'll go out there and one of them will take a laptop and they'll watch movies together or play cards or something like that so it really it really is something that they can enjoy together so it's been really really special and I love that we have that place for them and they can do that they, they are so thrilled to show off what they have and where they live and that's been that's been huge having that courtyard. We are really excited about what 2019 has to offer. We have lots of things that we'd like to share with you and um, ways that you can be praying for us and get involved. Our challenge is to reach farther out into the community, to reach more homeless than we have ever reached before and it's all about building relationships and building trust. We're very excited to, to open a pilot program with a day center where we can invite people in who aren't currently utilizing our services in our program. This is gonna give us that great opportunity to build relationships, to help those who are still um, not utilizing our services, those who are still living on the streets, to give them a place to go during the day. In order to bring them in, however, we're going to have to be doing some expansion here at our men's shelter. And with that, we will be um, renovating, completing the second floor. We have 10,000 square feet of unfinished space. We're going to be able to put 74 new beds up there and, um, and, and make it a, a little more um, uh, accommodating for those when they have moved forward, when they have jobs, when they have disability income, and they're gonna be able to uh, move upstairs, opening up space in the downstairs for more people to come in and work in our back to work program. So we're really excited about all the changes and how Wellspring can come together with us and, and do a lot of the same kind of work that you've been doing with us for the past five years, um, but it's gonna be on a much bigger scale. There will be so many incredible opportunities for people to get involved. So we just thank everybody. Horry County is number two in domestic violence in the state, the state's number one. Horry County is, out of 46 counties, number one in men killing women. And the state is number six in men killing women. In the 21 years that records have been kept, we haven't gotten out of the top 10. And without having a certified domestic violence shelter here in the county, uh, the county is going to continue to trend at the bottom. When you talk about any of the larger counties, there are counties without a domestic violence shelter, but it's unheard of. Any of, of equivalent size, bigger or smaller, they've got domestic violence centers. Georgetown had to scramble to uh, start, Family Justice Center had to scramble to try to start taking care of women and children in, in Horry County. So there's, there's currently only nine beds in Georgetown County for Horry and Georgetown County. Now, Currently, if the beds are filled, which are on a daily basis, um, then we're able to get them out, put them in a hotel room for three days. But staying in a hotel room for three days uh, generally ends them back up, back with their abuser because they have absolutely 
no way to figure out, okay, will I be safe permanently? Like I would be if I'm in a certified domestic violence shelter. Right now, it's a, a courageous decision to, to uh, make uh, the determination, I'm leaving my abuser. But when the ORI or uh, police department, they come and they say, okay, we're gonna take you to Georgetown. There are two beds, one for you, one for your daughter. The woman realizes, wait a minute, I'm gonna lose my job. My kids are gonna be displaced. Maybe I can't go. That's what'll change. It'll change, they'll leave. They'll have a place to go where their kids don't have to worry about changing schools. The uh, abused doesn't have to worry about losing her job. She, in essence, is the person being punished without having a shelter here. Um, she's being abused and then she's punished afterwards because she has to now make an impossible decision. When I was talking to our legislators and they were trying to, you know, what can we do? Can we give you more money? Do we need more? Your money is best spent in opening a domestic violence shelter like Family Justice Center because these guys have cracked the code. What Fred has come up with um, in bringing it to, to Horry County, in my opinion, is the best possible way. A person that has had to leave their home with their children in the middle of the night, they sit down um, not knowing where they're gonna eat, where they're gonna stay, how they're gonna be protected. Um, Family Justice Center, uh, you go, you get temporary housing. They um, help you with, if your kids need to move from one school to another, they help uh, in getting you job or uh, disability, um, getting that worked out. Everything that we don't even think of at three o'clock in the morning, they've got it there, they figured it out. In addition to all of that stuff, they have long-term counseling. Uh, their approach to it is to rebuild this person to get them back right. If you don't do that, if you don't help them at least establish where, where they're at, you can't expect them to come in and be a witness six, eight months down the way. If they don't have counseling, if they don't have a foundation, they're not gonna come back. And every time, they're either gonna be calling and asking us to dismiss the charges, they're gonna be uh, uncooperative uh, victims, not gonna testify against their abuser, um, and it's going to end up getting dismissed. There's no other way for it to happen. We gotta rebuild that other person, not only to where they can testify, but that also they could live life again. The financial drain on the legal system and social system is absolutely extraordinary. A, a certified domestic violence shelter would break cycles and it would lessen the amount of cases that uh, Jimmy and his counselors get and have to prosecute, um, thus bringing South Carolina into a better and better yearly position and having kids have the opportunity to end up not becoming abusers or not believing that they should be abused in a, a women's case many times. Last year, uh, when we had our first annual Let's Stop the Violence event, a woman came up to me afterwards and thanked me and told me, it was, you know, now I know people care. She asked me if she could tell me her story. She was married for 14 years. After about a year and a half, she started getting beaten. A few months later, they put, uh, the husband put locks on the inside and the outside of the door locks on the inside and outside of the windows and plexiglass. And this woman was held captive for 11 years, no sunshine, nothing. She only got out because her uh, husband forgot to lock 
one of the locks one day. When she came to the event, she said, I didn't know how to deal with the outside world. And so I hate to say I ended up on drugs, but I'm proud to say I'm 90 days clean today. So it's a story that brings a tear to anybody's eye, mine, uh, every time I, I tell it. And it, it's, it's too common of a story. But now she said to me, she got involved in the committee. She got involved with counseling with Family Justice Center. And she said, you know, now, now I have my strength back. Now I have my courage back. This is all of our problems. It's not a criminal justice problem. It's not a government problem. It is a societal problem. It doesn't have to be radical to see somebody in need and help them. That's kind of where we've been missing the boat. And that's what I really like about um, what Fred has put together here. Didn't need to be all government. Didn't need to be all grants. We got to get buy-in. Um, from the community. I, one of my grandfather's favorite sayings, and he wrote it in a letter to me uh, about a year before he died, and it was put into quotations, and I put it on the back of the T-shirt, was, it's never the wrong time to do the right thing. And this is the right thing. It's the right thing. And we are in the right place at the right time with the right God and the right resources to do something about it. And Wellspring's not going anywhere. There are needs, there are gaps. We want to fill them. Um, those are just two of the organizations we plan to help next year. We plan to do everything we've, we've always done. Uh, two more goals, two more kind of wishes for this, this offering. Um, many of you know uh, the Myrtle Beach School System. Um, they had to shut down for about three weeks this fall because of the flooding, uh, which meant they didn't get to do their normal fundraisers. Um, so there's a gap, there's a deficit, and what we're hoping to do with some of the proceeds from this offering is fill that gap, fill that deficit. Just, just here. Please don't send home any uh, wrapping paper. Here. <laughs> but we want to help. Um, we've partnered for years with Habitat for Humanity, and we've helped other organizations uh, put families in homes, and in 2019, um, our goal uh, is for Wellspring to, to partner with Habitat to give a family a home uh, next year. We, we want to we fill that gap. And we do all of this because we serve a God that loved us so much that he gave everything so that we could have a better life. And he said, hey, if you want to convince people to follow me, love them. Give everything so that they can have a better life. And so that's who we are. That, that's what we want to do as a church. And it's why today we come for this special time, this special moment that we've been talking about for a couple of, a couple of weeks. We've challenged everyone to, to pray and to consider giving the best gift you give this Christmas to helping Myrtle Beach feel the love of Jesus in 2019. We've challenged everybody that calls Wellspring home to participate because we know when we all do something, God can do anything. And we know that it's worth it. We know it's worth it because our lives have been changed. Our lives are better. And we know that the same God that did that to us wants to move through us. So that it doesn't just stop with us, but that our entire city, our entire region, our entire state, and our entire world will be better. And they will know it's not because of us, because of Jesus in us, because his love will prove to the world that we are his disciples.
So now we've come to a time we come to every week at Wellspring that I always like to explain to our guests because it may be unique, but I'll show you what we do and then I'll explain why we do it. Wellspring, it's time to take our offering. Every week we clap at this moment. We clap because one of our core values is that we believe that we get to give. We believe being generous, we believe being obedient, we believe giving back to God is a privilege, it's something we get to do because He first gave to us. And today we get to give not just our, our normal, what we bring back, but we get to give above and beyond to show Myrtle Beach just how much we love them. And I know for some of you, you're like, man, I didn't come prepared to give today. That's okay. Um, you can give online, you can take out your phone and, and, and go to our website and give that way. Or if you want to take that envelope home with you, uh, you can bring it back next week. You can bring it to any of our Christmas services. Um, we'll, well, the Christmas offering will go through, through our Christmas services because we want everyone to have an opportunity to, to, to uh, be a part of this, to, to, to make a deposit, to make an investment, as we talked about last week, in seeing people's lives change. So let me pray for you, and uh, we'll get back to God. God, we love you so much. We thank you for the privilege we have of serving you, of following you. We thank you for your generosity with us. We thank you for your generosity through us. God, I pray that you will just take these gifts, these tithes, these offerings that we're returning back to you right now. God, may they be used in 2019 so that Myrtle Beach feels your love, so that new people are drawn to you, so that their lives are made better. Uh, God, our prayer, our prayer is that this church will be known in this city and in this region, that we will be known by our love, that we will be known for your love. We will be known for helping. We will be known for stepping into the gap and being there when needed. Because that's who you are, and that's who we want to be. We thank you for these gifts. We pray to use them to change the world. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.